Next, we have our tetracycline antibiotics. These bind to uh, the 30S uh, ribosomal subunit reversibly and are bacteriostatic, so they don't kill the bacteria, they simply inhibit their growth. As a class, the tetracyclines are broad, broad spectrum uh, with gram-positive activity that's somewhat more limited than gram-negative activity. The tetracyclines have been used for a very long time and resistance is quite common. So if you do want to use one of these drugs, susceptibility testing is really essential. If we look at some specific examples where the tetracyclines have activity as a class, they're great against our staphylococci, including methicillin-resistant staph pseudintermediates, which we can encounter in our companion animal species, and then many of our unusual bacteria, so kind of the weirdos, intracellular parasites, things like rickettsia, mycoplasma, also bacteria like Vibrio and even Brucella. The tetracyclines are quite a lipophilic class of drugs. They readily achieve high concentrations intracellularly. And as we move from tetracycline to doxycycline to minocycline, we see increased lipophilicity. And so for you as a future clinician, what this means is that you'll get higher concentrations within the cell with minnow than you would with doxy, than you would with original tetracycline. Minocycline is also potentially a very useful drug for some of its extended spectrum. It's able to inhibit Stenotrophomonas multophila, which is an otherwise very difficult to treat, um, extensively intrinsically resistant bacteria, as well as Mycobacterium uh, marinum. Our fluoroquinolones uh, act by inhibiting DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4. These are enzymes that are involved in DNA organization within the cell. The use of these drugs prevents replication and supercoiling of the DNA and is ultimately bactericidal. Our first drug within this family, nalodixic acid, a quinolone, was only really active against the enterobacteriales, so E. coli. This very narrow spectrum of activity combined with the relatively rapid emergence of resistance um, led to it quickly falling out of favor. Chemical modifications of the quinolones leading to the fluoroquinolones, the fluorinated compounds, proved to be much more clinically useful. Ofloxacin, a first-generation fluoroquinolone, has excellent activity against gram-negatives, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and is oftentimes used today in ophthalmic preparations for treating eye infections. Our second-generation fluoroquinolones are those that are perhaps most widely used, drugs like ciprofloxacin and enrofloxacin. These have improved gram-negative activity compared to our first-generation fluoroquinolones and our quinolones, and also some gram-positive spectrum. And finally, our third-generation fluoroquinolones, a veterinary example being pradofloxacin, has a very broad spectrum of activity against gram-negatives, improved gram-positive activity, as well as anti-anaerobic coverage. This is also a drug with good activity against mycoplasma. The mechanism of action of the fluoroquinolones is such that activity is optimized at intermediate concentrations. If the drug concentration is too low, it's perhaps intuitive to think that it doesn't work very well, but at very high concentrations, we also get decreased activity. By affecting DNA metabolism within the cell, at very high drug concentrations, we essentially get inhibition of transcription of proteins, which are necessary for the drugs to have their mechanism of action. So we paradoxically see lower activities at very high drug concentrations. The aminoglycosides bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit, but also affect other parts of bacterial physiology, including the electron transport chain, DNA metabolism, and also the gram-negative cell membrane. This multiplicity of effects is responsible for their bactericidal action as compared to other protein synthesis inhibitors, which are generally thought of as bacteriostatic. The aminoglycosides are only active against aerobic bacteria, and that's because there's an oxygen-dependent uptake mechanism. So an anaerobic bacteria will simply never take the drug up into the cell, and it will never achieve therapeutic concentrations within the organism. The aminoglycosides are also frequently combined with beta-lactam-type drugs for synergy. The way that we think of this working is that the beta-lactam breaks down the cell wall, 
and allows enhanced entry of the aminoglycoside into the cell, leading to a synergistic 1 plus 1 equals 3 type situation. If we go through these drugs individually, streptomycin is really becoming a historical compound. Um, its uses range from bioterrorism agents to nasty zoonoses, things like plague or Yersinia pestis, Francisella tularensis, and brucella in people. Gentamicin is a commonly used aminoglycoside, and it has some of our best anti-gram negative activity, including against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Amikacin has a much broader spectrum of activity, great against Pseudomonas, but also some very useful activity against gram positives. In fact, in veterinary medicine, really companion animal medicine, amikacin is seen as one of our last lines of defense against methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus pseudintermediates, which is frequently multidrug resistant and increasingly susceptible only to amikacin. Amikacin, when combined with a beta-lactam, is highly active against Enterococcus species, and we also see good activity of amikacin against nocardia. Neomycin is a very narrow-spectrum aminoglycoside that's really only active against gram-negative rods. This drug is poorly absorbed after oral administration, and so historically, it was frequently used for treating E. coli uh, diarrhea in neonatal calves. And finally, spectinomycin. This is actually not an aminoglycoside, but an aminocyclotol, which is a related and quite similar class uh, of antimicrobials. It's active against both gram-negative rods and mycoplasma, and you may see this used in agricultural settings. The MLSBK drugs, uh, macrolides, lincosamides, streptogramin B, ketolides, azolides, there's a, a large number of subfamilies that are all related, that depending on whether you're a lumper or splitter, you may just refer to them simply as the macrolides. All of these drugs act by reversibly binding to the 50S ribosomal subunit and are therefore bacteriostatic. And they all have a similar spectrum of activity with a few subtle differences to each other. So our macrolide drugs, erythromycin, tylosin, tildiparosin, tilmycosin, and tulathromycin, are primarily active against uh, gram-positives, including gram-positive anaerobes, but they have some very specific anti-gram-negative activity as well. So those agents which are associated with respiratory tract infections, such as Pasteurella, Actinobacillus, and Bordetella, and then intestinal infections, such as Brachyspira. The spectrum of activity of the lincosamides, so clindamycin and lincomycin, really mirrors the macrolides. The ketolides have, again, a similar spectrum of activity, but with enhanced anti-gram positive action, so against our clostridium and clostridioides, as well as our staphs and streps. And these drugs also have good activity against rhodococcus. Our azolides, so azithromycin and gamethromycin, have, again, similar activity plus activity against some intracellular pathogens, such as rickettsia, and also some activity against susceptible enterobacteriales, like E. coli. So we start to see a little bit of uh, gram-negative spectrum. Finally, the streptogramins, um, such as virginiamycin, which is really only used in agricultural settings, good activity against anaerobes, gram-positives, um, including staphs and streps, Tuparella pyogenes and Fusobacterium necrophorum, which frequently cause infections together, um, as well as Brachyspira. This may be a compound that you reach for uh, when treating intestinal spirochetosis. Next, we have our phenicols. Like the MLSBK drugs, these act by reversibly binding to the 50S ribosomal subunit and are bacteriostatic. They are very broad spectrum agents, good activity against gram positives, gram negatives, and anaerobes. Um, and chloramphenicol is probably uh, most commonly used for treating conjunctivitis um, because of its uh, broad spectrum of activity and the uh, broad spectrum of agents that are associated with these infections. It's also a good option for treating methicillin-resistant staph pseudintermediates in our companion animals. However, chloramphenicol is associated with a rare but irreversible uh, idiosyncratic uh, adverse drug reaction in people, which is aplastic anemia. Uh, 
So between one in 20,000 and one in 40,000 people who are exposed to this compound will develop this condition where the bone marrow essentially shuts down, erythropoiesis stops, you stop making red blood cells, and you die. It's a condition which is uh, non-dose dependent, so exposure to a very tiny amount of drug can also induce it. There's no antidote, so we can't reverse it, um, and it is nearly uniformly fatal. So for this reason, the use of chloramphenicol is banned in food animals. There is zero tolerance for any residues of chloramphenicol in edible tissues. Fluorphenicol has a very similar uh, mechanism of action and spectrum of activity, but it is not associated with aplastic anemia, and so it is actually widely used in veterinary medicine. This drug has activity against all of the aforementioned uh, organisms, plus pastorellas, truparellas, fusobacterium, and actinobacillus. And for this spectrum of activity, it finds widespread use in agricultural settings. Next, we have our folate synthesis inhibitors, so our sulfa-type drugs, just like that first antimicrobial compound, protonsil. Our sulfonamides work by competitively excluding PABA, so para-aminobenzoic acid, from the folate synthesis pathway. So in this figure here, what you can see are all of the different uh, steps in the production of folate that happen in a bacterial cell. Folate, of course, being required for nucleic acid synthesis, ultimately DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. So the basic sulfa structure looks very similar to PABA, and dihydropteroate synthetase can't always tell the difference. So it will incorporate sulfa accidentally, leading to an inactive intermediary and shutting down the pathway. Our other folate synthesis inhibitors, our diaminopyrimidines, so trimethoprim, act by directly interfering with uh, dihydrofolate reductase. They directly inhibit this. Because these two drugs act at different steps of the same pathway, they're synergistic and are oftentimes formulated together in pharmaceutical preparations. Our sulfonamides are kind of oldies but goodies. They have a broad spectrum of antibacterial activity, including gram positives and gram negatives. Another potential option to use uh, when treating uh, resistant Staphylococcus pseudintermediates, including MRSPs, it also has activity against some protozoans and toxoplasma. So the sulfonamides find use outside of uh, antibacterial chemotherapy as well. Notably, Enterococcus is intrinsically resistant as our group A strep, although this is much more of a concern in human infectious disease, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also intrinsically sulfonamide resistant. Finally, we have the nitroimidazoles, or metronidazole. This is a low molecular weight compound which really readily enters bacterial cells. Once it's made its way into the cell, um, under anaerobic conditions, it's chemically reduced, so the process of reduction. Intermediate molecules in this reduction pathway are free radicals that are able to bind to DNA and prevent synthesis, leading to dead bacteria. So this is a bactericidal antimicrobial. Metronidazole is an excellent anti-anaerobic drug. It has very broad spectrum coverage, because of its mechanism of action and the requirement for reducing conditions, it has no activity against aerobic organisms or organisms under aerobic conditions. Metronidazole and other nitroimidazoles are also banned in food animals over concerns of potential, potential carcinogenic properties. In non-food animals, you may use metronidazole for treating infections caused by clostridium or clostridioides, Brachyspira, again, only in companion animals, and a number of parasites. It's active against Trichomonas, Giardia, and Entamoeba. We'll be discussing antimicrobial resistance in much more detail later in this class. Um, Organism-specific instances will be described as we go through each genus, and towards the end of the class, we have a lecture on antimicrobial resistance and stewardship, as well as several lectures highlighting uh, critically important antimicrobial resistance that's emerging. There are, however, a couple of key concepts that I'd like you to be aware of as we move into the next phases of this class. One is that resistance is natural. It's pre-existing, it's out there, 
And we see it as a problem clinically when we select for it with antimicrobial use. It's not something that we really create de novo. As future prescribers, what I want you to keep in mind is that antimicrobial use always selects for resistance, whether it's appropriate or not. So if you use a drug, it better be worth it. Antimicrobial stewardship is key to preventing and slowing down the emergence of resistance that really is becoming therapeutic limiting. I have a couple of new terms for today's class, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and of course, some self-assessment questions. Mm -hmm.